So today's topic is going to be the uh, buy, renovate, rent, uh, refinance, and repeat, the, the Burr method. Um, and there's a reminder that we will be recording it uh, for training purposes and for folks who couldn't make the live call. So uh, don't say anything bad about anybody. Um, we do have like over 50 people registered for the call. I I'm sure not all of them will join us, and, but I do expect more to pop in as we get started. Um, so uh, because of the number of people, if everyone could please stay on mute and then we'll, uh, we'll unmute folks as we get to the Q&A towards the end. So uh, the, the format or agenda for today, a quick company intro, roll call of, of our folks who are on the line, then I'll get into the uh, presentation and discussion of the Burr method with a couple of interesting case studies. And, uh, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. So we are Copeland Morgan LLC. We are a triple threat for real estate investors here in the Tampa Bay area. Area, <laughs> We are a real estate brokerage. We help folks buy and sell real estate. Uh, we are a property management company. We have about 300 doors under management uh, in Pinellas and Hillsborough counties here in the Tampa Bay area. And we also have a partnership with a certified building contractor uh, through which we're able to maintain and renovate those 300 units that we manage. And, and it, as it pertains to the Burr method, in many cases, we can help investors uh, renovate and reposition uh, those properties uh, and get them ready for a refinance. Uh, of course, uh, that's me. I'm the broker and owner. And we'll run through our team members who are on the call. I believe Claire is on. I'm here. And Doug, I saw you were the uh, one of the first ones on. I'm here, guys. And I don't think I've seen John pop in yet. It's kind of hard to keep track sometimes. Uh, he may be out selling real estate. I think Rob is tied up. Carmen, I do see Carmen there. Hello. Hey, Carmen, how are you? I'm good. Luke, I believe, is on. Well, I believe he's on anyway, even if he isn't speaking. And then Obed, I know he has a client in town, so I'm, I'm not sure if he's going to be able to make it. Uh, and then Thomas. Jamie's actually on the road, but said she might pop in. And then last but not least, Nicole is on the property management side, and I think she is out in the field working today. Which brings me to the, uh, the meat of today's presentation. We're going to be talking about the, the Burr method or the BRRRR -R 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 method. You hear that, that phrase tossed around a lot, but there's a lot of, uh, of confusion and misunderstanding uh, surrounding exactly what it means and exactly what it looks like uh, you know, when you put it into practice. And so I, I, I was kind of excited to dive into the topic today and answer questions for people. And I figured the best way to do it is to actually walk through the numbers on a couple of different case studies. And so that, that's what I've done. And, and I'll get into those after we go through, uh, you know, each step here. So the B, I suppose, is somewhat obvious. The investor has to buy the property. Um, and this is usually done with either cash or hard money because often it's a distressed property of some sort. The key is to buy it at some discount from market value or with some upside, the potential to add value through forced appreciation, renovations, better management, increased rents, whatever the case may be. But the, the, the underlying theme here is you have to have sort of a, a split between uh, you know, what you buy it for and what it could be worth um, at the end of the process. Which brings us to the second R, which is renovate or reposition the property. Renovations apply to both, but, but we're typically um, talking more about multifamily properties when we talk about repositioning because that involves um, you know, upgrading the quality of the property, the quality of the units so that you can raise the rent and, and reposition the asset from maybe a class C property to a class B property. And that's what we refer to when we're talking about repositioning. But whether it's a single family home or a multifamily property, it, it requires typically requires renovations. Uh, and, and the idea there is to increase the market value of the property. And as we get into the math here in a moment, it'll be very evident why that is. So the next R then is you rent it out. So you've got the place fixed up or you've fixed up one unit of a multifamily. The, the idea then is to rent it out to tenants or, or to new tenants at maximum market rent because um, 
you know, obviously you want to maximize your income on the property because that is what's going to increase its market value and also allow you to cover the debt service and holding costs on the property. And then once you've sort of stabilized the property and you have these great tenants in place paying full market rent, the idea is to refinance the property with long-term, low-cost mortgage debt. And that's typically, especially on the residential side, at 75% loan to value. And that is a crucial number for the Burr method um, because that's what allows you to recoup a lot of your initial equity or initial investment into the property. And the appraised value on the back end, the, the ARV, the after repair value, is, is really the key uh, to making the Burr method work. And then the idea is to repeat it. Uh, after you recoup a lot of your capital, um, out, you know, by refinancing the property, you have this pile of cash again, and the idea is to go find another property and, and do it again. And, and really, the idea is to to own a stable, renovated property with good tenants in place who pay the debt, uh, but have a minimal amount of your own equity, your own cash, left tied up in the property. And so, um, I think what really helps to cement the steps is to look at a couple of actual case studies. And so that's what I put together today. Uh, the first one is, is a single family home that, that my wife and I own. And, and it's a great example on the single family home side. And then the, the second case study is a multifamily property owned by one of our clients, uh, Taylor Brugna, who was on our call uh, talking about tax stuff a few weeks ago. Many of you know Taylor from that or, or from, other, uh, from other things. So that being said, I'm going to jump right into um, the numbers and, and what, how, how do you make the Burr method work? And the idea is to kind of start with the end in mind. And we talked about the fact that 75% of the property's value is typically what you can refinance. On the commercial side, it's, it's definitely the most you'll, you'll likely be able to refinance. So oftentimes it's less. But on residential, 75% is, is typically the set level of, uh, of your loan to value. So you should be able to get 75% of the property's value out in cash on, on a cash out refinance. And you use that to pay off your debt and pay yourself back for the renovations and the rehab and the financing and the holding costs and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but the idea is you want to stabilize renovated property, reliable tenants who are paying the mortgage and you have low cost, long term debt in place and you recoup all or most of your capital so that you can do it again. So here's our first case study. This is a single family home in St. Petersburg at 3253 57th Avenue North. It's actually kind of a funny story. I went there to buy the ladies washer and dryer because I needed a washer and dryer for one of our rentals. And I walked away having bought the whole house. <laughs> it didn't happen quite that quickly, but um, you know, over the course of talking to the lady, I kind of established a bit of a rapport with her. And I realized that this was her brother's home. Her brother had passed away. So it was a probate property and uh, ended up purchasing it from her for $120,000. And this wasn't like back in the day, this was October, 2019. So fairly recently, um, I, put down $20,000 and I had a hard money loan for the for the rest, $100,000. I paid three points and 8.9% interest, interest only payments for a year. So my payments were $741 a month and I paid the $3,000 in points as sort of an origination fee. Um, and we'll talk more about how those financing costs, um, you know, fit into the puzzle here in a moment. And then I spent about $30,000 uh, renovating the, the property. And here I have some before and after pictures. Uh, I'll go back and forth a little bit so you can kind of get a feel for it. There wasn't a whole lot of work to be done on the exterior. That was what it looked like, you know, when I went to buy the washer dryer. And then this is what it looked like, you know, when we listed it for rent about three months later. And some of these are uh, stills that were captured from a walkthrough video. So I realize they're not the best pictures. But if you kind of focus on the door there to the left, it'll, it'll give you a point of reference for the next photo, which is the after. And, uh, and so there were hardwood floors under these carpets. We were able to refinish the hardwoods, except in the kitchen, which you see through that archway there. Um, and so it was just a really cool house with great bones, you know, hardwood floors. Um, it's a two bedroom, one bath with a bonus room. 
And here's what the kitchen looked like, uh, you know, when I went to, to look at it the first time. And if you kind of focus on the refrigerator, the refrigerator was actually new and it stayed. And so that, that'll kind of anchor the next shot when you see the kitchen rehab. And, and then this is the backyard. This was another great feature for me that, that makes a really great feature for tenants who want to live here. But you'll notice, you know, what's missing in this photo if you have pets or kids? And the answer is a fence. And so, you know, one other thing that I wanted to point out is you can kind of see where I spent my money. I spent it on the kitchen and I spent it on a privacy fence because those are the two things that will drive value for tenants and, and keep your tenants in place. They have a nice fenced in yard for their dog or their kids to play in and they have a nice kitchen. Um, that's what gets you the most market rent. Uh, and just a side note, the bathroom in this house is really pretty dated, but we left the bathroom alone. We've, we spent our money mostly on the kitchen and, and you know, obviously the floors and, and, and the backyard. So um, what did it look like sort of, you know, through the process? About 90 days later, I think about January of 2020, we rented the house for $1,500 a month. Um, those same tenants are still in place. They just renewed for a second year in March of 2021. Um, and after it was rented, of course, now my tenants are paying that, that hard money note of $741 a month. So it kind of takes the pressure off. And then you start working on your, your loan application for the refinance. It ended up appraising for $186,000. And, um, and it's easily worth much more than that now um, because the market has just been on a tear for the last couple of years. So my new mortgage at 75% loan to value, that meant I had $139,500 loan amount or, or cash out. To, to, to utilize, to pay off uh, my hard money and to pay myself back for the, for the renovation, the rehab, the financing and the holding costs. And as a 30 year fixed rate loan at 4%, my principal interest taxes um, and insurance are about $1,053 a month. And you can see right back up at bullet point number one, the tenants pay $1,500 a month. And, and so the place is, uh, is cash flow positive, you know, barring any uh, any repairs or anything like that. It easily covers the debt service. Um, so let's talk about the costs. I, as I mentioned, it was a hard money loan. I paid three thousand dollars in in points, that origination fee for the loan up front. I paid about thirty seven hundred dollars in interest over the course of five months that I was making payments. Um, I think it took about three months to renovate the house and then a couple of months to get it leased up. Um, and at that point, my tenants were paying the debt, so I wasn't worried about it. And then I started the refi process. So out of my pocket, I paid about five months worth of those $741 interest payments. So my total financing costs were $6,700. Uh, renovation and holding costs were about 30 k And as we talked about, um, I put 20 k down or into the property when I purchased it. So all in, out of pocket, I had about $56,700 in the house. Now, one thing I want to point out, that doesn't mean you need $56,000 cash in your savings account. You can use your Home Depot card for these rehab and, uh, costs. Uh, you can use a credit card. You can use a, use a home equity line. Um, it doesn't have to be a pile of cash because you're going to get a lot of that cash back at the end if you do it right. So you can pay off your credit card. You can pay off Home Depot or whatever the case may be. So let's do some math. If, if the home appraised for $186,000 and I could get 75% loan to value, um, I already gave you the answer on the previous slide, but what does that work out to? 186,000 times 0. 0.75 is $139,500, that's correct. So that's what's available to pull out in cash. That's your cash out. But now keep in mind, you got some stuff to pay off. And so from that $139,500, which is 75% of the value of the property, which is what a bank will give you as a loan on the property, I had to pay off the hard money mortgage. The balance was still $100,000 because those payments I was making were interest only. So pay off the hard money lender, 
I paid myself back for the interest and uh, origination costs, my points and my interest payments. So that $6,600 basically went back to me. I paid myself back for the rehab and holding costs. And if you, if you do the math there, there, that leaves about 2,900 bucks, which was probably eaten up by closing costs on the refi, which basically meant that I owned about a $200,000 house. I think the appraisal was a little light. Um, I put $20,000 down because that's my $20,000 is still technically tied up in this house. Um, but you can't buy an investment property that's renovated and stabilized, uh, you know, and covering debt service for 10% down if you just go at it the other way around. And so this was a, a way uh, to own this house, you know, stabilized. But ultimately, at the tail end, I really only have $20,000 tied up in the house. All of my rehab costs, all my holding costs, all my financing costs were covered by the cash out refinance. And my tenants have paid the mortgage since day one, and it hasn't been vacant since they moved in. They're on their second year. So I personally have never had to come out of pocket to pay that mortgage. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the importance, the importance of the appraisal and how that can really make or break the deal. And, and appraisals are tricky because they're really the, the opinion, the professional opinion of one person on one particular day and what they think your property is worth. <clears throat> but if, for example, the home had appraised for 212,000, then how much would I have been able to pull out? 212,000 times 75% is 159,000. And that really changes everything. Had that happened, um, I could have paid off my hard money. I could have paid off my financing costs. I could have paid back my rehab and holding costs and I could have paid for the closing costs, and I could have gotten my $20,000 back, and I would have literally owned the house for next to nothing. And that is, is really kind of the home run Burr method, is when you get all of your cash back at the end, but it really hinges on the appraisal. Um, the other thing I'll mention is in an appreciating market, there's nothing that says you can't refinance again in a couple of years. And I certainly could do that now if I just had to get my, my $20,000 back, that, that initial equity, I could probably refinance it again. It's probably worth 225 now. And, and so, you know, but you have to figure out, well, are the, uh, the closing costs and the loan origination costs really worth doing a refinance again so quickly? Um, but just because you leave ten or $20,000 tied up in a deal doesn't mean that it's stuck there forever. You can always refinance two, three, four years down the road again and pull out some more equity if it's an appreciating market. Of course, there's also something to be said for keeping your loan to value lower and, and paying off the debt and, and owning the house free and clear someday. So there's, there's different schools of thought. So before we jump over to the, the multifamily um, case study, I'll, I'll open up to, you know, a, a short Q&A session here because we'll, we'll do some more at the end. But does anybody have any questions about the single family home burr or, you know, rehab, refi, rent uh, stuff and um, or the math that we talked about that makes it work? And if you do, just use the raise hand button and I will look out for that. Uh, Jeremy, you can go ahead and, and unmute yourself. Hey, Jeff and Adam, I see you there. You'll be next. A quick question. How did you, did you know the rehab was going to cost around 30K? Can you maybe dive into how you came up with that number and, um, you know, how that came into your calculation? Yeah, that's a great, um, that's a great question because you do need to be able to estimate this stuff on the front end because if the rehab had cost me 60K, this would not have been nearly as attractive of a deal. Um, have, I, this was probably the 10th house that I had quote unquote flipped, you know, many for resale, but ultimately the process is the same and, and you kind of have a pretty good idea. Well, I need to refinish some hardwood floors. I need to paint the exterior. I need to paint the interior. I need to rip out the kitchen. I need to put in new kitchen cabinets and new appliances. Um, and, and you really just go through it line item by line item and figure out, you know, well, I estimate it's going to cost this much. And uh, as long as it's close enough to make the numbers work, you know, then, then you pull the trigger and, and you hope you were right. Um, so um, being able to estimate in advance with, you know, some reasonable degree of certainty is certainly important. 
but you don't have to be exact. You know, you don't have to say, well, it's going to cost me exactly $29,234. That's never going to happen because there's always surprises. There's always stuff that you find. There's always changes and, 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 and things to the scope. Um, but, you know, within a reasonable 10% degree of, of, of certainty, yeah, you do need to be able to estimate rehab costs on the front end in order to make this work. Adam, you can go ahead and then Jordan, you'll be next. All right. How you doing, Jeff? Good. Uh, so I have a couple questions. So I'll just ask you my first ones until everybody else has had a chance, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, so first off on this, so what was the cash flow that you were making after everything was set and done on this with taxes and, and insurance and everything? Um, I mean, honestly, most single family homes are going to operate somewhere around break even. You know, as you can see, um, my principal interest taxes insurance is 1053 a month. It rents for 1500 a month. Um, and so, you know, by the time you pay repairs um, and, and just other common operating expenses, it's not going to throw off, you know, a ton of cash. And on, I could go back and, and figure out exactly what the cash flow is. But, um, you know, in, in my experience, single family homes are really more of a retirement plan. They're, they're not going to throw off a lot of cash now. Uh, but 20 or 30 years from now when they're paid off, um, you know, it, uh, one, you can delete that debt service and you've got an extra thousand dollars a month in cash flow. Um, or two, you know, they, they appreciate in value and you have a, a potential source of, of equity to tap. But very realistically, single family homes in most cases are going to operate somewhere around break even. You know, they might throw off 100 bucks a month or 200 bucks a month on a good month. And then sometimes you got to replace a roof or an HVAC and, and, and it, you know, obviously over the long term, um, single family homes are generally not a cash flow play unless you just get really lucky. I mean, that's a great question, but in my opinion, the idea with a single family home is you just have tenants in place that'll cover the expenses and cover the debt service. And, 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 and that's a, that's good. That's a, that's a win. Jordan, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, so on an earlier slide, you indicated what your mortgage payment was. I think it was around 1500 or something, but, but I was wondering if that was the before refi mortgage or the after refi, because I, I think what really matters is now what's your monthly payment going to be after the refi, right? Yeah. So before the refi, my interest only payments were $741 a month. You know, it was a $100,000 note at 8.9%. So that, that's pretty easy math. It's 741 a month. After the refi, um, my pity payment was $1,053 a month. That's what it currently is, $1,053 per month. And it rents for a little over $1,500 a month. I think they pay like a pet fee. So it's like $1,520 a month. Um, so, you know, about $500 a month uh, to cover operating expenses. The good, the good thing about single family homes is the tenants typically cover all the utilities. They pay their own water, they pay their own sewer and garbage, they take care of the lawn, they pay their own electric. So, you know, other than CapEx and occasional repairs, um, uh, you know, single family homes don't have a ton of operating expenses. Um, let's do one more and then I'm gonna move into the multifamily example and then I'm gonna open it up for another Q&A at the end. Sure, uh, okay, so this one was, was one that I had an issue with myself. Um, so when you did the hard money loan there, were, you know, were you able to do it without having to have an LLC? And if you did put in an LLC, did that affect whether you were able to get the refi after? Yeah, that's another great question. And because um, it, it is an issue I have run into at least once in the past. So yes, I do typically purchase, if it's going to be a flip or a, or a burr, you would normally purchase it in an LLC just for, if nothing else, for liability purposes. If, you know, if somebody breaks their leg, you know, while they're working on the house or something, you don't want them suing you personally. But typically, um, and it may vary from lender to lender, when you do the refi, you just put it in your own name. So at the closing of the refinance, you sign a new deed and you transfer it from, you know, Copeland Holdings LLC to, you know, your, and your own personal names, and, and you do that all in one fell swoop when you sign the mortgage documents, you sign a new deed, and so you move it out of your LLC and into your personal names at the refi. Now, the only 
only time I have seen that be an issue is, is some lenders I, I have seen and heard, um, they'll say, oh, well, you got to wait, you know, six months of seasoning anytime there's a title transfer, um, which is really silly if, if it's an entity that you control. And, and so I would just say, find a new lender that, that will be more realistic on that seasoning period. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in terms of seasoning, usually this whole process that I described, it's going to take three to six months anyway. Um, and maybe around the three month mark, the tenants are already in place. They're already paying the debt. Um, you know, my payment before I refied was $741 a month. So my cash flow was actually better with hard money in place, but that's only good for a year. And, but my point being, once the tenants are in place, now you've got all the time in the world to take a deep breath, shop around for a lender, find the best rate, find the best loan product. And if your refi takes three or four months, which ironically this one did because it was right in the middle of COVID, it, it took forever, um, but it was no big deal. My, my tenants were paying the, the hard money uh, interest only. So it really wasn't costing me anything other than frustration. Um, but, but yeah, normally you can just um, change the deed at the same time you sign the mortgage and, and do the closing for the refi. No problem. All right. So I'm going to move on to uh, a multifamily example, which the, the principles are all the same. It's really just walking you through a different set of numbers and, and showing you some pictures of a different property. And then we'll do some more Q&A at the end. <clears throat> so this is a property. It's a six unit it was a seven unit multifamily when it was purchased uh, at 2861 2nd Avenue South in St. Pete. There was a seventh unit that was sort of illegal. It was unpermitted and uh, ended up having to delete that unit, so to speak, but converted it to a laundry room so that it still produces some income. So this was a 240K purchase um, and it was a, a huge, huge project in terms of rehab, uh, about 425K in rehab and probably close to two years. Um, that was about 50K per unit and there are six units. Uh, total gut rehab down to the studs, new plumbing, new electrical, new windows, new roof, uh, new HVAC, you know, pretty much everything, including the landscaping. And, and so you're looking at 665K all in. So just keep that number in mind as we work through this. Um, these are some before and after, and again, some of these are stills from a video, so, so they're a little bit, they're not the best photos in the world, but it can give, it'll give you some idea of the difference. This is the side of the building to the left if you face it, so if you kind of use the sidewalk as your reference point. You know, it, it was truly a, a jungle <laughs> uh, at the time. And then that's what it looks like now. And then this is one of the kitchens. I know it's a terrible photo, but you can get some idea of, of how ugly the kitchen was. And if you kind of use the range as your focal point, uh, it'll kind of make sense when I show you the new kitchen. So let's talk about the numbers. Uh, the current situation after that extensive renovation that we talked about, uh, there are four two bedroom units in the front building. They are now rented at 1295 times three and then 1395 times one because the, the first lease has, has you know, rolled over to a second year with a hundred dollar increase. The two units in the back are rented at 1095 each and there are two of those. Um, so it's got almost a $7,500 a month rent roll. And based on that rent roll and that cap rate, it actually refinanced this year at $900,000. And so this is a property that was bought for two forty, dollars and now it's worth $900. Um, Taylor was able to refinance at 70% loan to value, which is about $630K. And if you remember that all-in cost at the beginning was six sixty five. dollars so basically he owns a $900,000 asset and he's got $35,000 of his own money uh, tied up in the equity in the property. So it, it's, not a, it's not your perfect burr where you have no money left in the deal, but, but it's pretty darn close to, to own a property uh, you know, for 3.8% down um, it is, is a pretty awesome deal on the back end. Now, of course, um, I know you're all thinking, well, yeah, but you had to have $665,000 to make this work. 
I don't know all the details, but I do know that Taylor used a construction loan for part of this. So it wasn't all, you know, $665,000 cash. He had some uh, loan in place during the process and it was kind of a construction style loan. Every time we completed the next phase of the project, they would make a distribution and pay the contractor. And then once the project was finished, he was able to refinance and, and pay off all that debt, much like we uh, we talked about on the single family home deal. But but really, when you look back, that's when you can kind of judge, you know, who wouldn't want to own a nine hundred thousand dollar apartment building for thirty five k? That's how much money he ultimately has in the deal, and that is the power uh, of the this Burr method. Um, so some key differences between single family and multifamily, the two examples we just looked at. Single family after repair value or, or just you know market value is, is always gonna be based on comps, comparable sales. If there's a similar house down the street, across the street, and it's sold for 200K and there aren't any significant differences, well, you can bet that this house is probably worth about 200K. And then you adjust for any differences, you know, if there's nicer fixtures, more square footage, an extra room, a pool, um, the appraiser makes adjustments for those differences. Um, but single family value is based on comps, comparable sales. Um, on a refinance, on a cash out refinance, single family loan to value is almost always just set. It's a standard at 75% LTV. So you, you, you know going in, you need to look at the comps to figure out the value and you know you're going to be able to pull out 75% as long as your credit and income and all that stuff is, is okay. Multifamily in some ways is a little bit more of a gamble. It's gonna be based more on cap rate. How much rental income does the property produce? How much are the expenses on the property? And from that, you can derive a value based on the market cap rate. Um, commercial financing products are kind of all over the place. It can be anywhere from 60 or 65% up to you know, maybe 75% or more loan to value. But 65 to 75 is a pretty common range. Um, and if you look at these three different scenarios here, at 65% loan to value, Taylor would have had 80K tied up in the property. That's still a pretty darn good deal. It's less than 10% down on a 900K commercial apartment building. Uh, at 75%, we already talked about, he's got about 35K tied up in the property. At 74% LTV, that would have been his magic number to literally have zero equity, none of his own money tied up in the property. And you can see the math there. This is because 900K times 74% gets him his 666K cash out and his all-in cost was around 665. And so um, you can see the importance of the appraisal. You can see the importance of loan to value. And where this really is important on the commercial side is if bank A says, yeah, we'll give you the loan at, at 60%, you know, and bank B says, oh, we'll do it at 72% loan to value. Um, you can really shop around on the commercial side and figure out which loan product makes the most sense. And of course, you also have to factor in origination costs and, you know, uh, closing costs and any other costs associated with the financing. You know, for example, that 74% LTV loan may have come at an interest rate that was 2% higher. And so it might make more sense to go to a lower LTV and a better interest rate. It all depends on your financial position and your, your, your timeline and your plans for the property. So that's pretty much uh, two examples. I'm happy to go back to any slides that you wanna see again. I'm, I'm happy to answer anybody's questions, run through the math. Um, the, the floor is yours, so just use the, uh, the raise hand button. And uh, from this point forward, it's kind of an open discussion. I do see one question from Carmen. Where does the 75% LTV rule come from? Uh, the, the answer is Fannie and Freddie. Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, those are the federal, um, federally backed uh, government service agencies or whatever, they basically buy mortgages on the secondary market and their underwriting guidelines say 75% loan to value. And so that's, that's the source of it is Fannie and Freddie underwriting guidelines. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Thanks, Jeff. Um, 
I'm wondering for that second, and maybe I missed this, that multifamily, how did they, uh, your buyer find that deal? <laughs> that, that's actually a really interesting story. It was, uh, it was a really rushed uh, off-market wholesale kind of offering that actually came across my desk. I pitched it to my client. It, it was one of these things where you had to be ready to sign the paperwork today and mm -hmm. ready to close in two weeks or something like that. And, and now, interestingly, I didn't mention this before, but Taylor bought it for two forty uh, the day before it sold for sixty. So somebody sold that property for sixty k, and we knew that. But Taylor still wanted it for two forty. He didn't care what the what the wholesaler or, or whoever it was had paid for it the day oh, before. Wow. What mattered to him was those back end numbers, and and you can see why on the back end. Um, you know, at, with three three point eight percent equity, he owns a nine hundred thousand dollar apartment building. So, you do have to sort of believe in your numbers and believe in your vision and, and believe that you can get there in a year or two. Um, but yeah, it was a wholesale deal. The the original owner was an elderly guy. He was kind of stressed out. He had a couple of mm. units vacant. A couple of units weren't paying. He was in the middle of an eviction, and he basically just said, "I just want to get rid of this property." He, he, he gave it up for 60K. They turned around and flipped it for 240. And then the rest is history. Wow. Jordan, I see your hand up. Yeah. So as a, an out-of-state investor and as a newbie investor, I think the thing that scares me the most is the, the rehab process and the prospect of having to find a good contractor, one who's not going to rip me off, one who's not going to take nine months to get, you know, a uh, you know, a job done uh, within reason. What advice do you have to offer to people like me about going into this process to, number one, just reduce anxiety, and number two, to avoid, you know, problems in terms of the rehab process, getting contractors and just getting it done? Yeah, I would say, um, well, first of all, I would say the second example, you know, the 600 or the 425K rehab over the course of two years, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily recommend that for, for a, a new investor. Um, but doing it with a single family home where the rehab is going to take, you know, 90, 120 days, it's not um, nearly as complicated. And, um, you know, the answer is you just vet a, a, a team or a general contractor who's going to oversee the project for you and, and do your best to hold them accountable. I can also tell you there are, it always takes twice as long and it always costs twice as much. Um, and, and it's a frustrating process, especially on the more complicating, more complicated projects like the multifamily example that we went through. In terms of a contractor, it, it, you know, go off a personal recommendation, you know, vet the contractor, agree to a timeline, maybe build in some incentives or disincentives for not meeting deadlines. Um, it really is just project management, uh, which many people do in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, it's just a different type of project. I just have to find the mute button. Uh, <laughs> on the, the renovations and such, it's uh, one of the things that uh, I just had a project that I've been working on for about a year now, a uh, single family home. Uh, the owners are in Italy and, um, they actually had a contractor that they had used on other projects in the past. So I, I, I was basically their boots on the ground, their eyes and ears and uh, keeping up with everything. And I basically, you know, once a month would go by the property, see where everything was, do a video, you know, some pictures, answer questions, that kind of stuff that they had uh, about the process. And I kept in touch with the contractor uh, just so that they could see it because they're in Italy and they can't even leave their own house because they're on, you know, real restricted uh, lockdown over there, uh, nowhere close to what we have here. So um, they, they couldn't even make the journey over. But over the course of the year, we wound up getting everything done. And, and if everything goes as planned, we should be closing on the 20th of this month. So, uh, but it's, it's the rehab process. Um, is difficult as an out-of-state um, type investor, but it's definitely doable. 
uh, being out of state because of the internet and the, the way video streaming and everything else is, uh, YouTube's been incredible to be able to get them videos of, of everything. So it can work. It's just a matter of, um, I guess, as an investor, your tolerance level as far as what you can, what you uh, are willing to go with. Yeah, that's a great point, Doug, that the technology certainly makes it easier now. Meg, I do see your hand. I'll get to you in just a sec. Um, yeah, the technology now, I mean, we could just as easily do this Zoom call from a, a job site and, and, and walk through a, a construction zone with your contractor. And it's not quite the same as being there, but, but it's not like it's 1982 and we're trying to do it with cell phones or with, uh, you know, pay phones and beepers either. So uh, we, we do have a lot of tools we can leverage to help with things like that that certainly make them a lot easier. Another good point you brought up, Doug, is I believe your clients, it really was a flip. They have no intention of keeping the property or refinancing it. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. It was a fix and flip for them. Uh, they and, basically did $90,000 worth of renovations on the property after buying it at two eighty five, dollars and we've got it contracted for four ninety five. dollars So uh, they're, they're, they'll make a pretty penny on it. And that took about a year. And most of that was due to COVID just because of supplies and contractors getting sick and COVID and all that kind of stuff. Sure. But my point there is that it's okay to not know on the front end what your exit strategy is going to be. And be, the reason I say that is your clients are a perfect example, Doug. They could sell it and make close to a hundred grand now, I don't know what their tax situation is in Italy, but for a U.S. investor, you're going to pay short-term capital gains tax on that. But that same property would make a great burr, you know, if they wanted to keep it. Um, the spreads really are the same, whether you're going to flip or whether you're going to refinance and hold. You, you, if you're going to flip, you've got to have some equity in order to make any money on the deal. If you're going to hold you've got to have some equity in order to be able to refinance and, and, and cash out. And the numbers for either exit strategy are very, very similar. And the first time I did the, the burr, it was sort of by accident. I bought a house, I fixed it up. I was going to flip it for whatever reason. It didn't sell. There were some permitting issues. And, and I said, you know what? I'll just keep it. I'll put a rental, I put a tenant in there. Ended up keeping it for two or three years and then selling it later on and actually came out, you know, way ahead of the game by doing so because you pay much less tax and you've got the rental income, you know, for the, for the years in between. Meg, go ahead. Okay. Um, my question was just around refinancing for the very first time with a burr, what are some common issues to think about or things that arise? Um, are you talking about a, a rehab project or just the actual financing process itself? I mean, I'd be open to anything that you have to share. <laughs> um, one of the things I would say is, is the timeline. Um, so if, if you go into it with cash, um, you're going to be tying up a lot of your cash or if you're using, you know, your Home Depot card or your, or your Visa card or whatever, um, you know, you're going to be tying up all this cash or all this debt for, for several months. And so you have to be very cognizant of the timeline. If you're using hard money, you're, you're paying interest only payments every month until you get a tenant in there, at which point, obviously your tenants cover the debt service, but, but th that's interest only. That doesn't do anything for your principal balance. And so th there is this pressure to get things done quickly because every month that you wait, it, it, your costs go up. Um, and, and so the timing is crucial. You've also typically got a 12 month, you know, sort of sunset on most hard money loans. So, uh, you know, if, if you get to month 12 and you make that 12th interest payment, uh, your, your, your hard money lender is typically expecting to be paid off. Sometimes they'll let you extend it, but they're going to charge you a pretty penny for it. Um, and uh, so, so the timing is crucial. You, you want to get the rehab done as soon as possible so that you can get it rented as soon as possible. Because at that point, you can kind of take a deep breath and say, okay, the tenants are covering all my expenses now. Now it's time to start shopping for a refi. Um, and again, I, I mentioned, you know, trying to do a cash out refi in the middle of COVID. What would normally take six weeks took almost six months. And so... You know, the, the sooner you start, the, the, the more breathing room you have to, to get all of the underwriting 
and, and steps to closing done on the refi. Um, so so I, I think um, probably the most stressful thing is, is the timeline. You know, you're, you're under the gun to get the rehab done, get the tenants in place, and then you, you kind of take a deep breath, but now you're under the gun to get the refi paperwork in and, and get all the underwriting done and get your refi to closing. Um, but it's a really good feeling when you finally close on that long-term refi and you have long-term debt in place at three or 4% for 30 years. You have tenants in place that are paying your mortgage. You get all that cash back to pay off your, 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 your replenish your own cash or pay off your credit cards or whatever. And then you start looking for the next one. I'll be honest, it, it, it sounds really complicated, but, but it's not. It's not that bad. You fix up the house, you rent the house, you apply for a new mortgage, you refinance, you sign some paperwork, they give you your money back, and then you do it again. It all hinges on the appraisal. And, and you know, e even this one is a perfect example. I was, I was hoping this house would appraise for 200K, and I still think it should have. But sometimes, in my opinion, appraisers are a little conservative on appraisals for a cash out refi uh, because they know the bank wants them to be a little extra careful so they're not over leveraging themselves. And so I, it came back at 186 instead of 200. As it turns out, I'm still pretty happy to only have 20K tied up in this house, but it definitely hinges on the appraisal um, and, and then it also hinges on your rehab costs. And Doug brought up another great point that this isn't your house. You're not going to live in it. So in many cases, you don't want to spend an extra 15K to relocate the kitchen or, or, you know, go overboard with the rehab. It needs to be clean, pretty, livable, rental quality. Um, and, and really on, on the Burr method, you're not even going to go to flip quality. You're going to go rental grade, builder grade stuff because this is just going to be a rental property. You're not going to be selling it. And all this stuff is going to get worn out and used by tenants for the next 10 years or whatever. So um, yeah, the, the, the variables that you can control really are your purchase price and your rehab costs. The variable that you can't control is the appraisal. And those are your three, you know, those, well, those are your two biggest risks is cost overruns or a short appraisal. But Doug, you brought up another interesting point. Even though you had one that was what you would consider a total failure, you just hand the keys back to the hard money lender. He's happy. You're happy because it didn't ruin your credit. Didn't You don't owe him any more money. He got the house. And I bet if you went back to that same hard money lender and said, hey, I, I want to do it again, he'd be like, yeah, sure, let's go. Because and, it was a and, win for him as well. Yep. And actually, I did use him about a year and a half later after I, I got more knowledgeable and I went back to him and he goes, oh, yeah, I remember you. You gave me a free house. Thanks. I appreciate <laughs> it. I went up selling it and made some money on it. I appreciate you doing that. And you even did all the renovations for me. Yeah, of course I'll loan you some more money. What rate you want this time? I went, I want 2% because I gave you a house. And, and <laughs> of course, he went with 6 But, you know, I still, I didn't have to pay the 9 like I did the last time. So, so it did win later. And that's another common question that I get asked is what are common rates for hard money? Uh, I, I would say nine to 12 is pretty typical right now with about three or four points up front. So on a $100,000 loan, you're going to pay $3,000 or $4,000 in points up front. Um, sometimes they roll that into the loan. So you have to pay interest on that as well. And then you're going to pay somewhere between nine and 12% interest. And as much as that sounds like, oh my goodness, that's a really high interest rate. We just ran through the numbers. It really doesn't matter. I mean, what did I pay? $3,000 in interest over five months. It does not make or break the deal. And honestly, if it were 12% instead of 9%, it wouldn't have changed my numbers at all. It's the ability to get the hard money, close quickly and get the project moving along quickly that matters. The, the hard money terms really aren't that important. The difference between 9% and 12% over five months or six months or even a year doesn't really change a thing. Meg, go ahead. How do you manage your debt to income ratio when you're refinancing? But I, I think what you're asking is, um, as you build your portfolio and you own more houses, um, you know, how does your, your mortgage debt versus your rental income affect your DTI? Um, 
generally the answer is it's net positive. I mean, my this house is a perfect example. It rents for fifteen hundred dollars a month, but my mortgage is a thousand dollars a month, and so that 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 rental income, you know, passes through my LLC to my personal um, uh, tax return. I'm also able to take depreciation on the house on my taxes, and that's a whole other CPA question. Um, and in some cases, when you're buying a rental, the, the lender will even let you use a percentage of the estimated rental income, you know, to, as, as part of your DTI calculation. Um, I actually just talked to Tracy Mayo, our, our residential uh, loan guru, who did, our, did one of our calls a couple of months back. I'm going to have her on again in a couple of weeks. And, and diving into the, the nuances of, of DTI is really a better question for somebody like her. But, but the answer is, yeah, I have more debt, but I also have more income because of the rent. And, and they tend to sort of move in lockstep. Um, and, and another you know, factor that ties in is, is going back to those Fannie and Freddie underwriting guidelines. You can only have 10 conventional loans. And so typically you, you get to 10 before, before your DTI stops you from getting another loan you get to 10 properties and you can't get any more loans anyway. Um, in your situation, you can get 10 and Jeremy can get 10. And, and so that's, some people keep their loans in separate names for that very reason. So something for you guys to think about. Well, I know there, there's a lot to, a lot of pieces to this. So I, I hope, uh, hope this all made sense and I hope it helped to sort of solidify the, the, the broad strokes by rent, you know, rehab, refi, you know, it, it all seems so simple, but when you dive into the details, uh, it, it, there's a lot of different moving pieces to make it all work. So I, I hope this helped. Um, Adam, I do see another hand up. Go ahead. So this is, you know, obviously the million dollar question here with this stuff, but, uh, you know, obviously in terms of leads for this, is it, you know, to, to get a burr, a deal that is low enough to actually be able to burr, is it mostly from wholesalers? I mean, you know, the, what's the what's the 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 main way that people get these deals? Honestly, I, I think they come from all sources. Uh, you can find them wholesale. You can find them direct to seller. Uh, I would even say you could still find deals that could make sense on, on the MLS. I, inventory is so tight right now; it's harder. But the the market for your cash or hard money only rehab fixer upper deals it, it sort of operates independently of your 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 retail you know inventory where you know come retail home buyers and so there there are still fixer uppers you know on the mls doug I, I don't know you probably do more of that than i do in terms of looking for fixer upper single family homes on the mls so you might be able to weigh in but they are out there, and I think single-family homes are actually much easier to find than, than multifamily right now because there's simply more of them. For every fourplex yeah. that exists, there might be a 1,000 single-family homes, and so it just gives you a lot more to choose from. And, and just to go along with what Jeff's saying, um, yeah, there are deals on the MLS that you can get. The, the trick is either, A, you have to have hard money to do it, or you have to have the cash because... Uh, if it's in disarray, the one that Jeff showed us in the single family here, that one wasn't so bad. I've seen some really gut jobs. And matter of fact, I think Jeff just sent us one a couple of days ago, uh, a real gut job that it's going to take a lot of money. And if, if you're a new investor and you don't have that kind of money, then, then hard money is the route to go. But just keep in mind, like you said, if you're out of state and you're trying to get a contractor, I would line up a contractor first, get comfortable with somebody that you're familiar with and have talked to and, and find out what their, their goals are, their timelines, that kind of stuff. And just basically tell them you're an investor, you're looking for a contractor, <laughs> this kind of stuff. So kind of do your homework ahead of time. And then when you do get a property, you can call them up and say, hey, can you go run a you know, quick report on this or whatever? and uh, have them, you know, give you a, a, a estimate, you know, of cost. That way, when you go to your hard money that you've already researched and found, then you can go to them and go, I need 85,000 for this particular, you know, property. Uh, I need 40 to buy it and 45 to fix it. And it's gonna be worth based on, you know, comps or whatever. 
um, of 200, then that's a good value. Every property is different. And like Jeff said, single family is probably the easier to do that with. So even if it's a wholesale deal, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good deal. You still have to look at your numbers. Even if it's a foreclosure, you still have to look at the numbers. Sure, you'll attest to this, Doug, because between the two of us, we probably flipped, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 houses. Um, and and typically it's a typical process. You start out as a flipper and then gradually you realize, wait a minute, I don't like paying 30% you know, tax on my gain. So I'm going to keep this house for a year or two. And even if I do sell it, I'm going to sell it a couple of years down the road. But, but my point being between the two of us, we've flipped or bird a, a lot of houses. And I can honestly say, they come from all sources. I've done HUD houses. I've done foreclosures. I've done MLS. I've done wholesaler. I, I've done them all. And um, the, the ones you brag about at parties are the ones that just fell into your lap. This lady called me out of the blue. I went to buy her washer and dryer. I bought the whole house, man. I can't believe it. But but the fact of the matter is that any source is fine and, and you'll find deals from any source. Just don't limit yourself to one in particular. Run the numbers. And if the numbers work, it doesn't matter where it came from. Well, it's just like the one that you were talking about, the multifamily today that, that Taylor got that, you know, the day before they bought it for 60 and sold it to him for 240 For a wholesaler, he's the one going around going, yeah, I bought it the next day I sold it and made, you know, so much money, you know, this is the way to go. You brought up another interesting point, and I'll close with this, that um, the shift from, you know, flipping this house and, and making, you know, $180,000 or whatever, the guy who, who sold the multifamily, you know, he made that in a day and he paid 30% tax on that on his, on his taxes that year. But the shift from that to, if you look back three years down the road, Taylor owns a $900,000 apartment building. He's only got, you know, 3.8% 3, 3 down tied up in that property. He owns that property for the rest of his life. His kids will inherit that property someday, or maybe he'll 1031 it into a bigger apartment complex someday. You know, that, that shift from flipping and making a quick buck to holding and building wealth and building generational wealth is, is really, I think that's where you cross over from, um, you know, sort of that flipping mindset to that building long-term wealth mindset. And the Burr method combined with things like the 1031 exchange that we talked about two weeks ago, it, it really opens up so many different opportunities to maximize. We all have limited capital. Nobody has an unlimited supply of cash, but through using the Burr method, through using the 1031 exchange and all these other tools that, that we talk about and we teach, uh, you can get the most bang for your buck out of the limited cash that we're all going to generate in our lifetime.